great. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for coming, especially the weather is not really, really good today. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, yes, today I will talk about uh, some of my uh, ongoing work on, you know, generating architectural layouts and interior designs automatically, uh, especially with respect to some human uh, considerations. Well, so let me begin with a story. Well, <laughs> this is a drawing of the Stone Age, right? So which was about 5,000 years ago, so our ancestors, uh, they were like that and they didn't have any idea how to, you know, survive in this environment, but they, they have, you know, superior cre cre uh, creativity, right? So, however, so because they have superior creativity, they were able to, you know, make use of the environments to help themselves, right? Like make shelters, make fire, make weapons to attack, to defend, and, you know, create words and characters to pass on their knowledge and this creative process goes on and on and for thousands of years and now we live in a completely different world where we can enjoy like good clothes uh, convenient transport uh, comfortable homes and you know a, a number of products so with the intelligent computational design tools we believe that we will be able to create an even you know Bet even better, more comfortable, more uh, <coughs> people-friendly uh, living environment. And today I'm going to talk about some of our research efforts along that direction. So my research group is interested in devising uh, novel computational tools to, uh, to solve different design problems. So we hope that these tools, we are now not only the experts, but also like general users to uh, express their creativity to create the designs. So one thing uh, special is that uh, the designs that we create, uh, in addition to being aesthetic, we also want to consider uh, the functionality side of it. Right? So for example, the layout that we design, we hope that it can really be useful for architectural uh, purposes. And uh, so, Today I will focus on talk uh, on talking about the like the architectural layouts and interior design uh, uh, things. Uh, so we also have other three uh, D modeling works, but uh, I will skip that for that for this talk. So for the first thing I want to talk about is how to automatically generate uh, human centered uh, interior design. This is actually a, a work I did uh, when I first uh, started my PhD study. Uh, back in UCLA, uh, this this was my major project uh, during my PhD. So, uh, let me tell you a story. So, Craig, how about you give us some context too for, for what you do? So, tell us what was your PhD primarily in computer graphics? Yes, my background is, uh, is computer graphics. Uh -huh. So, uh, I started with computer graphics, and then I also stepped into some computer vision stuff, visualization, recently I also do some uh, virtual reality stuff. So it's all about the visual computing side of things. So, uh, so, so I can play this again. So this is a tool that you may have used, right? Uh, it's from IKEA, right? So you want to buy some stuff from IKEA, but this is actually a very you know challenging problem. <laughs> like you have you have many choices of products, and you drag and drop the products, and then you need to arrange everything into good shape so this is troublesome and this is our algorithm so you can see that like it can automatically generate the interior design uh, with respect to some criteria um, and we hope that like this will become the mainstream in the future so our approach uh, consists of uh, two major steps one is a learning step another is an optimization step uh, in the learning step we extract some interior is uh, some rela spatial relationships from some interior design examples okay and we are going to reuse these uh, relationships when we do the synthesis okay so for the optimization stage it starts with a initialization so it's like i randomly shuffle all the furniture objects in the interior space and then uh, our optimizer will iteratively update the furnish uh, the furniture arrangement Okay, uh, evaluate it uh, with respect to some criteria that updating the environment until it is good. 
So if it is good, then the synthesis is done. So the, the approach starts by learning from some positive interior design examples. Uh, for example, you can you know get these uh, uh, examples from human designers. Uh, we just need like ten or twenty of them. And this and this shows the spatial relationship we learned from an example. For example, we have. Uh, <coughs> you may want to put this uh, 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 desk near the wall, right? That's the, the the usual thing to do, right? So we learn about the prior distance between the uh, like the desk and the wall. Uh, for some other objects like this table, maybe it is it, it is quite common that it is in the center of the room. So we can you know capture this kind of relationships from the example, and also the orientation. And we also need to learn about some hierarchical relationships. If a laptop, it can exist. It can it can it can be put on top of the table. So we extract all these relationships. Right? But you never see like, like the laptop being on the on the floor, right? So we can be sure that like which objects should be on top of which object. And uh, the user can also define some pairwise relationship. For example, uh, no matter how, uh, right, that's my, that's, that's my uh, requirement, right? So uh, the user can specify that uh, by specifying like, oh, I want a pairwise uh, uh, distance between the two to be within a certain range. Uh, the angle should be, you know, they should be facing each other. So they can, they can, the user can note and code that, and then we formulate the whole thing as a uh, 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 optimization problem. So the optimization problem uh, uh, is centered around a total cost function. So we have a total cost function, which is a weighted sum of cost terms. So each of these cost terms capture a particular aspect of the interior design right, to tell whether it's good or not. So we have a bunch of terms. And the variable here is uh, is this phi, which consists of two uh, parameters. So each, so this is a like a set. So a set of furniture objects. For each of these, so these, for, so this denotes one furniture object. We have its position. We also have the furniture object. Uh, uh, this position. This is the uh, orientation. Uh, orientation. Yes, the orientation. So basically, uh, this is a variable. Right? So we want to uh, change these variables in order to, so if uh, these variables change, then that means the uh, arrangement will change. Right? So we want to uh, uh, arrange the furniture objects such that they minimize uh, the total cost function, which captures how good whether, uh, I mean, which evaluates how good the design is. Okay? So this is the formulation. So yes? Well, yes? Can I get a clarification? So in your diagrams, what is B, uh, 1, 2, and 3? Is that the relationship to another object, or is that uh, giving you another width or depth? Uh, which B1, one? B? B... So if you explain... One. Could this one? Yeah. Yes, so this is... Uh, so for each furniture object, we use a bounding box yep. to represent it. Uh, and B1 bound. is the diagonal of the bounding box. So the reason we did this is because in the... Uh, in some of the cost terms, we will make use of it. Like this, yeah. this term, we will make yeah. use of it. Yeah. Uh, I won't go into the details of each term, but I will tell you like the, uh, uh, the, the, like the objective of each term. Okay. So we have a bunch of terms. Well, yes. Just one, one clarifying question. So, yep. when you actually go through the learning stage, yep. are you gonna primarily learn the weights? No, we want to. We learn. <coughs> we want to learn the prior distance and the prior orientation of the furniture object to the wall. So where, where, where do those prior then things enter the, into the, the cost calculation? Yes, the prior, like uh, for like this one, so like the prior distance cost, so we have a target. This target okay. is, is learned from the examples, okay? So, uh, so we have a one number of uh, uh, cost terms, right? So for example, we have an accessibility cost, so basically, uh, it defines a space around each furniture object. So for some uh, sign of the space, you don't want it to be uh, uh, occluded. Uh, uh, I mean, you don't want other objects to step into that space, right? For example, uh, this is like the front of, front of side of the chair. You don't want any 
object to be uh, staying here because that would make the uh, furniture object uh, not accessible. Right? So for some signs, maybe it's fine for you know uh, putting things there, like at the back of the chair. Well, you can block it; it is fine. Right? But like for the frontal sign, you want to leave a certain space. So we can also uh, learn about this, uh, like the uh, uh, this empty space from the examples. Like in the example, you may see that uh, the frontal side of the chair is always uh, uh, free free of objects, right? So you can you can learn about these uh, spaces also from the examples. And then we have these uh, visibility costs. So for some objects, you may want to maintain the visibility, right? For, for example, for this whiteboard, so you want to define space in front which should never be blocked. Right, so I cannot like put a bookshelf here, right? Because that would block this board and make it invisible. So we have this cost to penalize that, and then we also have the pathway cost that ensures that there must be a pathway between uh, doors, right? So people can walk from one side to the other side. Well, just uh, yep. put on the, on the, on the so that. Yeah, I, I, I'm okay with having the, uh, all the coefficients in there, yep. uh, but it, it is going to mean there's going to be a, a lot of param basically these cost, these are in essence cost functions with many parameters, right? So in order to actually estimate the parameters, you're going to have to have, see many, many examples, right? Um, so you know, if, I, if, I have, if I have five parameters and I only see two examples, then I can't really infer much, right? Uh, well, so these are not, these are, um, so you so these are not parameters. So these are these are actually from the dimensions of the object. So like if I have this object, I can already compute this thing. So I don't have to estimate. But for example, so I'm just so, uh, so I guess that's what I'm going to uh, so sure. imagine that Martha Stewart designs an interior versus my wife. Okay, mm -hmm. and presumably they're going to have different sensibilities about how much accessible space they want, how much adjacent space, whatever. That's true. So they would have two different. Designs. Yep. Neither one is going to be optimal for you know for, for you or me maybe, but but they, they each would think that you know there would be a Martha Stewart type design it has a certain amount of you know adjacency whatever it is right. Yeah. This is my my wife's design would have a different amount right. Mm -hmm. So it seems like you you know there's you know there's no if my my point is that there's no objective this is this is not like you know we're trying to minimize energy or something right. This is purely aesthetic. Mm -hmm. So there's no so the A D sub J K. Yep. Is going to depend on somebody's. On the examples, yeah. So basically, that depends on the examples. So right. we capture, we extract these parameters from the examples. From I mean, the yeah, but that's, that's my question. So yeah. say, true or false? Isn't it going to be the case then that if I, so, if I have ten parameters, yep, I'm going to have to see ten different examples, right? Otherwise, um, the thing is not identifiable. So if if you have an example with this chair, yeah. So from that example, I can already extract all these parameters. But why only one? Yeah, but where, 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 yeah. Where yeah, instance yeah. of each one of them, right? Yeah. So there's, there's no statistical power then, you know. And, and if, I, if I see if I see ten Martha Stewart designs, I then have a much better sense of what 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 yeah. So works for eight yeah. So if I have if I see multiple examples of this, then I can use a statistical model to capture uh -huh. uh, the range of the parameter. For example, you can fit a, a normal distribution. You know what is the mean this uh uh, uh AD one ADI one. Right, like how much space people yeah. allow for that in average, so you can also capture. So, that. How, so how many examples do you have to have to make this make this kind of formalism work? Uh, in our in our experiments, we use about five. That really? Yeah, yeah, yeah you can. Yeah, you can. You you don't have to use a lot. Hmm. Yeah, because for so each example, you I for if like if I see this chair in one example, I can already extract the statistics. I uh -huh. mean these parameters. Yeah. The but surprising thing to me is that so in economics we estimate cost functions all the time, mm -hmm. and we typically you know we, unless you have a large number of samples, you don't really you know your your, your estimates are quite noisy. You don't really believe them. And, uh, so you, you that, yeah. That, that, so that, arguably that, this is why only now in the modern era when Google has you know ten million of us looking at the same book or something online do we actually mm -hmm. know what the true cost is. Yeah. So. Yes, so you can say, well, if I only have one example, then you are just capturing the right. style of one particular person. Uh, so that may not be um, robust. a very robust or very good uh, estimate, uh, but that can give you something uh, that follows the style of that person. 
So, uh, we didn't we didn't really uh, use a lot of examples that time mm -hmm. because it was expensive to create an of example. Course, exactly. yeah. <laughs> right. But these days, uh, there are some tricks to uh, help with this. For example, people capture uh, the 3D environment. I mean, the real 3D environment, and then from that environment, uh, they can they can get a lot of data, like for estimating all this. And then, but it's also too there is this idea that um, I mean, for the moment, that there's the, you use this interior design, but imagine it's architectural. So it's not take two or three famous architects. Yep. And so say say you had you know here are all the Frank Lloyd Wright designs, here are all the Frank Gehry designs, and here's now yep. all the IMP ones. Yeah. Uh, it seems to me that if you if you tried to use all those examples, yep. you would end up with something which is going to be a, mo a mess of, uh, <laughs> uh, it would not necessarily be aesthetically for anything, right? So That's you would, true. You have to keep, you know, the, 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 the people who think they have, they make good designs, you want to keep their examples segregated, yeah. somehow, right? So. so I believe it's not a good idea to have a mixture of yeah, everything, right. but uh, you may have a model uh, that captures a particular designer style, so that like, Basically, you get you have a shelf of you have a you have a collection of styles, and uh -huh. you can apply whatever style for your synthesis. Okay. Yeah, sure. So you have the pathway cost, and and then we also have the prior distance, prior orientation causes. So these are for uh, penalizing the uh, like the uh, distance if it is deviating from the target, like the target distance that we learned from the example. Uh, so we have the prior distance, prior orientation with respect to the wall, uh, and then the pairwise, and then the pairwise distance, pairwise orientation. Right? Uh, you m remember we defined some pairwise relationships that we want to maintain. Right? So if it, you know, the synthesis deviates from that relationship, we will also penalize that. So we have a weighted sum of cost terms, and we apply a stochastic optimization to optimize the cost function. So uh, we apply the uh, uh, simulator annealing technique to do the optimization. So simulator annealing has a cooling schedule. At the beginning, uh, you have a temperature parameter. At the beginning, the temperature is high, so it's like you are, you know, boiling soup. Right? So you boiling soup so the ingredients can uh, move around very aggressively, right? So so as to uh, explore the solution space. Over the time, the temperature drops gradually following a preset uh, schedule, and the rearrangement becomes less aggressive. And at the end, the temperature drops to zero. So basically, that means uh, we're finding the, the solution. Right? So, uh, so are you going to say, Kurt, so well, why, did you, why did you pick, or well, why is this, this particular abstract optimization technique used? I mean, we know this is as, as, a, as, a, as an heuristic these days. Yes. You know, it's, it's, yes. Not, it's not a way to find the globally optimal many thing, right? Yes. It's just a heuristic. Uh, the reason we want that is because we want the framework to be more general. So we can, if we need, we can incorporate more uh, cost terms into the framework and generate into a design that satisfies that. So this is a technical point, sure, but I, I, it's my, 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 my belief that um, in, you know, the reason why phys physicists use this approach is because they typically are going to model in a large number of interacting objects, something like, you know, 10 to the 8th or 10 to the 12th mm -hmm. or some you know, number of galaxies or something. Mm -hmm. So they would have, they would not be able to compute the global optimum. Yep. But uh, certainly the case is there are techniques like, you know, a robust optimization technique, where as long as you have on the order of like, you know, a dozen things, or mm -hmm. even even if you had, had a thousand things, you can certainly, for these days, you can certainly enu you know, exhaustively enumerate every possibility, you know, yeah. and find the global optimum. But, but in this case, we don't really need the global optimum. So we want to generate a number of uh, good enough uh -huh. uh, local optimum and then pop okay. them up as the suggestions to the designer. Okay. Yeah, so that's why. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, okay, so, so the only, the only issue, the only thing I, I wonder about though is that do we, so the, in the space of all possible designs, yep. that technique is picking out a few of them. Uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah, you're right. yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, you're right. So the, like the landscape, we are just picking okay. some of the which ones it's local optimums. Could it, could it be? Could that technique be, be pruning out ones that are actually quite good, and we just we don't even know it because you can't put any theorems about those results. Right? Um, yeah. So when I did the debugging, so I look at uh, each of the cost terms. Yeah, right. So I I need to ensure at least you know each cost term is below a certain threshold. Uh -huh. Then I can tell it satisfies a certain relationship uh, pretty well. So yeah. that's the way I analyze it. So, so this is a op uh, optimization Drops. iteration. So for each iteration, you have a move, right? So the move is for modifying the solution. So 
for example, I can uh, pick an object, I can pick an object, and then I can translate the object, right? or I can pick this object and then rotate this object. Uh, I can swap two objects, so maybe I can like pick this and then pick your chair and then do a swapping to see whether it get, uh, uh, gets me to a better solution. Uh, I can also move, I can also change the pathway, the uh, control point, uh, uh, when I reason about the, like the pathway cost. So, so basically, uh, I apply a move, I get a new solution. Right, so like this one, I pick this couch, and then I orient it this way. So I get a new solution. And then I, uh, for the simulator editing, I uh, need to compute a metropolis criteria. So basically, it's a probability, it's a transition probability. So it tells, it tells you, uh, so this probability defines uh, whether, uh, what the probability that you will accept this new solution. So basically, if this solution, new solution, uh, is associated with a lower cost, so that means it's a better solution, then you will accept it. If it, if it is associated with a higher cost, so that means it's a worse design according to the cost function, then I may or may not accept it. So the the wor the more worse it the worse worse it is, the lower the probability I accept it. Okay. So, like if it is not just slightly worse, then I may still accept it in the hope that uh, after I accept it, I will be able to get you a better solution next time. So, so uh, so this is the probability, and then I have four dice to accept or not accept according to this probability. Uh, so this is uh, one example of generating multiple designs. So we can see like, so these are four different ones and you can generate four different designs. Uh, these four are the four local optimums I get. And, but each of the each of the designs uh, satisfy the relationships I define. For example, some pairwise relationships like between the uh, the, the desk and the chair. Uh, uh, <coughs> like the the door here is not blocked, right? So I, I have these uh, relationships, and uh, each of these synthesis will satisfy. Is that a curiosity? So in this research community, do people ever use evolutionary algorithms? Yes. So people also use that like uh, genetic algorithm to do the optimization. Yes, people use it. Just uh, FYI, because because you're you know, George Mason, it, it has been this history <laughs> of George Mason that there's been a lot of people who use those techniques. To sure, like Sean. <laughs> yeah, sure, Sean, or of course Sean's advisor, De Young, and yeah. De Young was a student of John Holland, who who has been. Yeah. So can you, can you go go yep. back? There was something that sure. Like your processing of this. Yep. is using your cost your cost function your cost function is not affected by shadows no but you are paying to develop those shadows <coughs> in your layouts the shadow the shadows because you of, of around your objects there it's showing a realistic image and you're computing all that seems like you yes. don't need that you could do it as a, a exactly a so 2d problem not a 3d problem so what when I implement it I just did the 2d so okay. basically you can look at it as like a 2d plane with a bunch of pawns okay so that's the that's the most basic yeah. representation of it but this for the, the sake of visualization of course this I, is the I marketing would, version yeah, you, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay but I need to communicate to the, <laughs> okay. to the community right so okay. how this can be applied for the interior design yeah. okay. I, I did try to do the 3d version but then after I implement it a uh, little bit, I find that I'm just wasting my time. Why? Because, uh, so for 3D, you have one more dimensionality and the problem becomes much more complex. Right? So because uh, uh, like you, 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 have one, you have many more solutions, right? Mm -hmm. And then I find that uh, many solutions are not feasible at all, like I may have a phone floating here and I need to evaluate and then how about I move this phone to be here <laughs> and I evaluate, I'm just wasting my moves, right? So at the end of the day, I just do a 2.5D version of the optimization. So what I mean is, uh, it's basically 2D. However, it also allows 0.5D 
along the z-axis, so that uh, along the y-axis. So that means like this phone, it can exist on this plane or exist on this plane. Yes, it has different, yeah. Yeah. you know, height. But is, I mean, by doing this, I'm, you know, optimizing it in a more efficient way. Yeah. Uh, 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 you also have things on the walls. Yes. And they could be down for toddlers. They could be up for very tall people. Yeah, so I also yeah, I also have things on the wall. That's another thing. So I I allow the like the poster to be floating on around, the but surface. It, it must be attached to the wall. Yep. Yeah. So it's like this is the two point five D thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So have you thought about some kind of optimization of behavioral utility for the room? So for example, you could have you could get something very simple, like we want everybody to be able to see the classroom yeah. professor, yeah. or something more complicated where we want to teams to be able to work better in groups. Yep. Have you looked at that in some of the uh, design exploration? When I first worked on this, no. And yeah. then after that, there were a lot of works, yeah. you know, like based on this uh, framework, and then extend yeah, yeah. Uh, along the direction you talked about. I also work on that, uh, yeah. on some follow-up works, because it's very natural. Like, People will want to synthesize space, not with, with respect to interior design rules, but maybe with respect to the uh, activities right, that well, the I space mean, support. The, the reason yes. why I ask is that the purpose for your design exploration is to meet the needs of the people inside yes. the room. Yes. And the people inside the room don't need to fit most efficiently. Yep. They need it to suit a certain yep. purpose. Yep. And so you can embed the meaning yep. of purpose in your objects, yep. but you also have activity like space to move around. So if you have exactly. kids, Maybe you need more space for them yep, to run around exactly. in circles, uh, you know, whatever <laughs> you need to do. Yes, but flat. if you have an yeah. elderly person, yeah. you know they need a different kind of spatial arrangement. Yeah. So, so, you, um, so your argument is also suggesting that design is for the people and not people. People should adapt to the design. Is the other argument? Yes. Yeah. Yes, that's the implication. So in the uh, uh, next thing I talk about, I will incorporate some of the ideas yeah, yeah, there yeah. and show you. So I synthesize like factories, flower shops. Uh, restaurant, uh, galleries, that resort. So this is like a walkthrough of some of the scenes synthesized. So like a resort. So I can have uh, like um, like music corner here because I define some pairwise relationship between the musical instruments. So pop up. And the factory scene. Uh, so I have a lot of pairwise relationships here because I want to maintain the, uh, you know, the, the chair to be facing the work desk. Mm -hmm. And right. for within it, this group, I also have the pairwise relationship between like different sets of taxes. Do you deal with flow between workstations? No. But okay. yes, that's a very nice extension. So in yeah. the next work, I, I, I start to incorporate uh, you know, that sort of idea. So this work. So after I work on the interior design thing, I think we can extend the work to more large scale uh, type of architectural layout synthesis. And so we, we work on this work. Um, it's called crowd-driven with scale layout design. Uh, it's like incorporating human behaviors in the synthesis process. Uh, so this is like a, uh, a layout that we can generate. So basically, the algorithm is generating this this layout, like how to cut this space into different rooms, right? And the uh, and the rows. So these are commercials that I just want to <laughs> tell people that okay, with this uh, floor plan, you can you know apply the interior design algorithm to generate each of this of, of the room, so that you can have a like a whole space procedurally generated. Okay, so so as I said, the, in this problem, the input is the site, right? It's the domain where you want to generate the, 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 the floor plan. And <coughs> the, so the output is a floor plan together with these uh, rooms. For each room, you have a like a functionality. Maybe this is a restroom, maybe that is a, you know, a boutique, a restaurant, and so on. So one thing special is that we want to incorporate uh, uh, human factors considerations uh, in the uh, design process. So uh, this is in the same spirit as some of the architectural design concepts uh, to design human-centered uh, 
living in environments. So, so we would like to uh, 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 incorporate human factors, but how can we do that? Uh, one very trivial uh, solution is to incorporate crowd simulation right, as a evaluation tool right, mm -hmm. to reason about oh, wh whether this layout is good or not. If it is not good, then I will modify it until it is good. So, uh, uh, so crowd simulation has been used for uh, architectural design uh, with a visualization type of things, right? Like you have a layout already, you can run crowd simulation and you can mm -hmm. test uh, uh, which areas of the layout is good or not. Uh, and it's also for like, it's also used for uh, doing visualization, uh, 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 crisis training and, and, and other, so other things. So after conducting a cross simulation, as I said, so you can uh, uh, compute a number of metrics, right? That tells you uh, uh, which part of the layout is problematic, right? For example, maybe some parts of the layout is too uh, congested according to the crowd simulation, then you may want to modify it uh, to improve the design. So in our work, we use crowd simulation not only for evaluating a layout after the designer uh, finish the design, so but we use it for driving the layout optimization, so that uh, the final design, uh, final layout design, we could say it's crowd flow aware. So again, the optimization is done against a total cost function. So we have two sets of cost terms. Mm -hmm. uh, so this <coughs> set of cost terms, we call them the agent-based cost. So these causes are computed uh, by running a agent-based simulation okay so for example we can compute mobility accessibility coziness so uh, uh, from the crowd simulation uh, 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 experience and then we have some prior causes uh, which are computed by some real world layout statistic for example uh, uh, we may have a prior that uh, tells you how many shops uh, typically in a shopping mall or what are like the f square ratios of you know all dimensions of different uh, 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 rooms so we have some prior so these are this is less important compared to this right so this is just some like constraints that we usually follow but how are you quantifying coziness yeah i will i will i will give the okay. formulations yeah so uh, first, we look at the agent model uh, for generating the crowd simulation. Well, uh, the most basic uh, agent-based model we use is the uh, state machine model. It's very, it's very basic. But then we, so we use it for testing. But then we extend it and uh, also apply other crowd simulation techniques uh, in our optimization to see whether the generator layouts uh, can also, you know, uh, carry this uh, like uh, human. Uh, related properties. So like real humans, in our basic model, the agents can perceive their surroundings. Uh, according to the social distance theory, so a person could perceive uh, another person within a certain distance. You, pro you probably know better than me, so I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm telling something that you know you may consider very basic. But anyway, so normally he reacts by adjusting his walking speed. Right, so which is negatively correlated with the crowd density. So basically, uh, more if there are more people uh, within a certain distance, then you walk more slowly. So in our problem, if an agent perceives a crowd density over a certain baseline value, uh, it will start to walk more slowly. The higher the crowd density, uh, the lower the walking speed. So, so we have a agent, and then we have a uh, a range. Uh, that you can, the, the agents can sense uh, the number of people inside. The more people that there are, uh, the slower, the, the more slowly he walks. And to get the agent based cost, we need to do an agent based simulation. Well, we simulate the agent's activities by a simple state machine uh, 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 for the first experiment. So there are many agents. Each of the agents enter the layout, thinks about the next uh, site to visit. For example, if it is in shopping mall, maybe he, uh, the, the agent wants to walk to the bookstore, right? So then the agent walks to the site and then enter the site, visit the site for a period of time, maybe one hour, 
and then leaves aside and then this goes on and on until the end of the day or until uh, all the agents have finished their objectives. So this is uh, uh, the definition of our course. So first we have a mobility course which evaluates how smooth the agent's walking experience is. So basically, uh, if the uh, agent's walking speed is slower, is lower than the default walking speed, then that means during the navigation, the agent feels constriction. Right. So in that case, uh, we assign a higher cost uh, using this formula. Otherwise, it is a low cost. And then we have these uh, accessibility costs. So it evaluates uh, how reasonably two sides are distributed. So basically, it evaluates the uh, distance the agents need to walk from one side to another side. For example, uh, I am in the uh, restaurant. Okay, and I want to go to restroom, which is understandable. Okay. So, if I need to walk an hour in order to get to the restroom, so this is really bad design. <laughs> it's very bad design, and this cost will be high. Okay, so if uh, I just need to walk two minutes to a restroom, then it is it is good. Okay, so uh, this is the accessibility cost. Well, but for some pairs, maybe you don't care, right? Like. Maybe you are in the restaurant and it takes one hour for you to walk to, uh, I don't know, the, 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 the trash room. Right? It's fine uh, because you, you don't usually go there. So the agent simulation, in the agent simulation, uh, even though like, uh, you, know, you need to walk a long distance there, but that may not happen that often. So it's fine. And then we have this uh, coziness cost, which evaluates how uh, good the agents feel when visiting the site. So we, evalu we, we evaluate that by uh, accounting for the uh, crowd density that the agents experience in the site. For example, if I am in the boutique and there are a lot of people around me, then uh, I assign a low cost. And if, if I am in the boutique and I'm the only person there, so I may also assign a high cost for that. So there needs to be a certain range of crowd density uh, that is associated with a uh, good coziness. Uh, I don't exactly remember uh, like how we come up with the target of that. Probably we look at some literature uh, in order to come up with the uh, appropriate amount of uh, uh, crowd density for the coziness. I was going to comment on that, Kirk. So basically, so up until now, when you had the cost before with the placement, it was always about distance, so it was common units. Yep. So here, though, even though the things are roughly dimensionless, but there will be dimensionless velocity up here, dimensionless distance here, and then something like uh, the crowdedness is something like you know, uh, measure of a gap between such a similar distance. Um, many of us are social scientists, mm -hmm. so um, this is a common thing we see when kind of natural scientists try to do social science is computer scientists, for example, yeah. is that for the most imagine in climate change models, it'd be common for people to say, well, what really matters is how much sea level rise there is or what the temperature changes. But what really matters to humans is what is the value to them of the sea level rise? Does it swamp their house, yes or no? It's not, it's not, it's not whether it's up by a, by a meter or not, it's whether it's, the, it's you have to wrap the, the, the technical variable in a value function. And so what I'd be much happier with here to call this, to call this really a model of human behavior I'd like you to wrap C sub M and C sub A and C sub C, put those as arguments in a value function. So how much do I value coziness? Maybe mm -hmm. another value is coziness much more than I value accessibility. Put my threshold for coziness. I'm in a wheelchair, accessibility matters a lot. Yeah. Right? So in order, in order for it to be, real, be social science as opposed to be, being you know, computer science, mm -hmm. you typically would want to have some, some, way, some subjective and basically, when it becomes subjective, then yep. every individual is somewhat heterogeneous, right? Yep. And so that, that would make it more palatable, I think, to, uh, to I think so. And you may, I think you may also learn, like, the utility function right. of each mm -hmm. group of each type of possible user. users. Yes. And then uh, use that for the formulation so that you can generate layouts that are optimal with respect to certain groups. The other way to say is that basically, by, by just adding up these costs, Linearly, you're using a very special value. Yeah, right? yes. yeah, that's true. 
So okay, so uh, this 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 that is a great idea. Uh, so again, I uh, apply the uh, stochastic optimization similar to my previous work for optimizing the thing, but this this time I am changing uh, 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 some other variable, right? Like uh, I may uh, uh, slide the boundary of the of the layout, right? I may change the path width to be wider or narrower. I may change the type of the site. That uh, I assign, right? So maybe uh, swap uh, the type. Uh, I mean, change the type from restaurant to a restroom, and see what happens. Uh, I may add or remove path, merge or split size, or swap the blocks. So, so uh, this is like the optimization process. So it's starting from nothing. So I cut the size, uh, cut the space into a different size, and then I run the optimization to you know iteratively. We find it uh, according to the <coughs> crown simulation causes. So uh, these are some examples. For example, I generate a grazer for any mall. So so I have a lot of agents who want to go to restaurants. And in the synthesis, you can see that uh, there are many like dining places appearing in the synthesis, and they are quite conveniently connected. Right. So in this, so I I have another uh, synthesis. Where I changed, uh, I make the agents more tolerant uh, 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 in terms of the like the uh, uh, the coziness. Okay, so in that case, so I have many more many like small sites, right? So this is a bit like a flea market, right? So you have many sites. Uh, it's quite uh, accessible. You can go from. You know, one type of site and another type of site very easily because there are many many sites. Uh, but each of the site can be quite small, right? So it can be uncomfortable. But uh, I intentionally set it that way because I expect the agents will be like tolerant to this kind of uh, situation. So one problem with the agent uh, agent based uh, simulation is that uh, it is. Uh, Quite expensive, right? So because we have yes. Before you go to this next expensiveness question, yes. So one of the interesting things that kind of going through my mind is yep. I assume facilities are restrooms in your example. So there are Let's certain see. categories of facilities in your various design layouts that have a special human-centered need. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> restrooms maybe need to be visible and accessible. Can you give it a special set of optimization in your? Your calculations here. So you mean the uh, restrooms and, and flea markets are awful. So, <laughs> but restrooms <laughs> in, uh, in in malls are usually slightly better designed because uh -huh. they they put a set of parameters on there that yep. says we need restrooms to have this kind of functionality. Yep. Can you differentiate in your, your your types here so that you get a prioritization of say one type like restaurant? Like go back to your restaurant example. Yep. So this makes it so that. Restaurants are more accessible, but maybe you need restaurants and bathrooms to be more accessible, to be more, accessible. more visible. So can you have more than one? And so right now, uh, as I remember, so we, uh, so the restrooms belong to the facilities, in yeah. our example, yeah, yeah. and the way we uh, uh, ensure like the like the restrooms are accessible from mm -hmm. the restaurants is that in the agent-based simulation. We have many agents who follow the sequence of going from restaurant to the restroom. So we have many, you many, have yeah, we have many, uh, many, many agents following this pattern. So that so it's essentially, I will give more weight to it's these considerations. So it's incorporated into the agent goal. Yes, okay, yes, that's yes. How that's so because each agent has a sequence of like tasks to finish, mm -hmm. so there are many examples of. Going from restaurants to, and then to restrooms, right? Now, so now what about <laughs> embedded facilities? So restrooms are in restaurant. Restrooms are in restaurants. Uh, they also may be in certain larger stores. Mm -hmm. So can you embed that kind of need into into this? Yes, you can do that because well, you may uh, in the agent simulation you can let the agent go to uh, you you said uh, like this. Particular kind of like yeah. maybe an electronics IT store. Or yeah, maybe an electronic IT store restaurant. has a restroom, so you can also encode that. Yeah, so that's okay. that's the flexibility we allow. Yeah. 
something that seems very strange and I finally figured out what was bothering me about this. This has a, if this is a mall, you can leave, it looks like, every 20 feet at, or enter at any point all the way around. You don't have a small number of entrances yep. and flow through to get access. You've got everybody connected to the outside. That may be a bad mall design. Yeah. Uh, uh, from the security standpoint. From the, <laughs> from the and also from the uh, 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 mall owner standpoint, because yep. the, the mall owner may force you to walk through yep. a number of shops in order to you know yep. get money from your pocket. So we can also have a like objective yeah. to you know encode the like the profitability of this. Design, well, that's but we didn't, ratio. we didn't, we didn't do it. We didn't do it. That's, that's the ratio we, of, of yeah. marketable space versus public space. Exactly, exactly. So, right, so and, and I would like to point out that yes, this may be hard to secure, but it's easy to escape from. Oh yeah, <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> you know, you have to balance those two uh, yeah. requirements. Yeah. So I. So the acceleration thing is well, uh, we, so my student work on this. So he said that it, gen it took, like. Maybe more than 10, 10 hours to generate one design. I don't exactly remember the time, but it is understandable because. Before you go there, Craig, just, just, just clarify for us. Um, someone told me recently that, for example, uh, AutoCAD, which is a common design program right, for spatial layouts and things, now does have an automatic crowd simulator in it. Is that, is that true? You know? Automatic crowd simulation. That I believe they may have the yeah. crowd simulation for the evaluation so you thing. Just, you I do your architecture and then it'll, 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 it'll at least put some, yep. some kind of. <coughs> yeah, I, be, I believe so. That, 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 so that, that can be done in kind of quickly, I think. But, uh, yeah. oh, okay. So, so uh, we experience a very slow speed because uh, you, we need at least hundreds of agents, right? And we need to simulate the behavior from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. Right, and we need to be of a re reasonable resolution. Like right? for every five seconds, you need to update the locations of the agent, so you can imagine the, the amount of like uh, computation involved. So it's a very slow process, and it's not good because, and we need. So we are just talking about one iteration. Like I generate this layout, you run this crazy cross simulation, gives me the cost, and then I do another update. Right, so. We need like 300 updates at least in order to generate a layout like this. So it's <laughs> super slow. So I'm going to watch the, watch the time because I want to share with you. <laughs> but anyway, so maybe I can speed this up uh, 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 a little bit. So at the end of the day, we, uh, we apply another approach uh, that involves uh, machine learning. So basically, we generate, a we use cross simulation to generate a lot of training data that tells us uh, the experience of the agents in each of these uh, uh, examples. And then we train some uh, classifier to automatically associate the features of the architectural layout with the agent experience. For example, if the path waves are very level, uh, the paths are very level, so it's very likely that the accessibility is, is bad. Let's say there is such a relationship. So we can use the classifier, uh, I mean the machine learning model to capture that, so that when we are really doing the optimization, we are not optimizing against the cross simulation, we are optimizing against the prediction of the classifier that we trained. So that way it will be much, much faster because you, you ask the classifier to get give you the prediction, it just takes a second and so. So uh, that's the trick we apply at the end. So I, I try to skip this, uh, otherwise <coughs> I may not have the time to talk about the other stuff. So of course we, we, uh, we did some evaluation to uh, confirm that like the, predict, like the prediction uh, is a good approximation uh, to the real cross simulation. So, so this is like the tool you can see. So like these are the agents uh, 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 properties. So we divide the agents into surf several groups. So some are greater. So some like to go to restaurants. Some like to go to shop, and and then we we make it into two that uh, the user can control this, and then we can generate a layout. So 
So it also allows like uh, some user interaction. For example, if the user uh, wants to add a path between these two points, so we can update uh, the layout. So basically, the optimizer just needs to run maybe 10 or 20 more times uh, for that local region to update. So we generate the, like the layouts with this method uh, for train stations, theme parks, campuses, and X examples. And uh, so, of course, we leave, so we use the uh, the basic agent-based uh, simulation. We also try other simu uh, 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 cross simulation models. Uh, uh, I don't remember exactly the model we try. We tried uh, one is called Continuum Crowd, which is quite uh, popular in our domain. And we also tried a cross simulation by a third party software. So basically, we replace our our agent based simulation model with that uh, cross simulation model and compute the metrics using that simulation to drive our optimization. And we also evaluate our results uh, using a third party cross simulation model. So, like, I generate the layout with cross simulation model A, and then I will use cross simulation model B to check whether you know there's some improvement according to cross simulation B, cross simulation A, uh, model B, and we can see some improvements. Like this is a real world layout, uh, uh, and it's very congested originally. And then we can run our optimization to modify the layout uh, to improve the congestion uh, automatically. So recently, we also work on uh, uh, something along that line is for like generating wall network. Like you have uh, uh, like a like a map, and with some uh, data like the uh, density of jobs in different regions, density of residents. Uh, the terrain, the elevation. So we want to apply procedural modeling techniques to generate the wall networks automatically. Like, how do you lay out the like the well walls, the main walls, the small walls uh, in the city, such as so as to, you know, uh, facilitate right the uh, uh, efficiency of the whole public population. So we are working on we are working on that. Uh, it's not published yet. And recently, we also work on some spatial computing uh, type of research. For example, generating some uh, uh, VR uh, training experiences, like I can generate cities that allow people to learn how to drive uh, safely. Right? Like if I'm really bad at turning, let's say, so I can generate a city with a lot of turns so the user uh, wearing the <coughs> VR headset uh, can practice using the system. Uh, some assistive uh, or workplace uh, environment design, mm -hmm. like basically we now we have the like the virtual reality headset, which is really popular. So we let the user wear the headset and then do some tasks in the virtual space, like cooking, and then we can learn about his or her behavior, like how he or she cooks. Based on that thing we learned, we can apply the earlier algorithm I talked about to optimize the space, but with respect to the functionality, right? So like, I mean, we'll optimize the kitchen such that the placement of different objects in the kitchen will facilitate uh, cooking, right? Let's say. So I have, and then refining design, you also have uh, uh, a, a work on that. So this one is similar to the crowd base, uh, uh, I mean, the crowd different mixed scale layer of the line. But this one, we focus us on the vision of the agent. So we want to place the signs in the environment such that the signs can efficiently lead the agents to get to their locations. So for example, like you're in an airport, right? And then there are many signs you need to go to the gate uh, A, right? So uh, we explicitly encode the vision of the, of the agent uh, in the crowd simulation so that the agent is, it kind of is, is has a like cognitive model, so it understands the environment by looking at the signs. Right. So essentially, we can let the optimizer place the signs optimally, such that the placement will facilitate the movement <coughs> of the agents <coughs> to their destinations. 
So we also work on that. And also like some ad visual ad attraction placement, but uh, it, there are some VR headsets these days that can track the human eye gaze. That's very important because that tells us like which regions in the in the environment attract human attentions, right? So that we can like uh, train a classifier. You give me an environment, I can tell you which regions are going to be, you know, attractive to the to the to the to the person, so that we can do something like suggesting the placement of artworks or advertisements uh, in the environment. Do, do you include crowd placement in your, your 3D there? So crowd? Yeah, no. Because like, that might obscure your vision of the app. No, so the, we were complaining about that. Uh -huh. But we didn't do that. Okay. Right? Uh, because uh, it's too complicated. So uh -huh. we don't know what crowd simulation is a good model. Uh, like. Uh, to, to integrate into yeah to integrate into this and second uh, yeah there are other issues like the person may walk may, may like uh, occlude may be. so so there are other issues that we mm -hmm. we, did, we didn't we didn't we didn't uh, proceed like that so recently I also got a uh, NSF uh, project on what we call the perceptual data guided computational design so these are some of the projects that are funded uh, by the NSF run. So the idea is, is actually very simple. Basically, uh, because now the virtual reality devices are so popular, so we can obtain a lot of behavior, behavioral data, visual attention data from these virtual experiences. Like you may have a virtual supermarket, you put a person in, you say, oh, you need to do grocery for like tonight, right? So you can look at like which look you can from the experience you can tell like how the person is going to navigate a supermarket and where like which products will get more attention so from that data we can uh, power some layout optimization algorithm to like automatically arrange the grocery store to maximize maybe profit maybe convenience maybe you know other factors so and we also use like uh, these kind of uh, virtual environments uh, to do training. Uh, for example, earthquake training. Like, we can generate some virtual environments. We can put humans in and let the person experience, uh, you know, disaster. For example, earthquake. Uh, we hope that like through this experience, you know, the person can learn some skills to protect himself or herself. If and we all you can also track the person's experience, right? During the v VR uh, simulation, for example, if she is really not good at doing something, we may generate more events of that sort mm -hmm. so as to improve her skill. So, so at the beginning, when I work on the stuff, uh, the the interior design stuff in two thousand eleven, it was just some fun projects. But then it was uh, quite successful, and it got uh, featured in the New Scientist. And these days, I, I, I'm very happy that like <coughs> AutoCAD, they are doing something similar in their software. Like, they have uh, computational design tools for generating layouts automatically. They claim that if their Toronto office was designed by their tool <laughs> automatically, I don't know whether that's the case, but I mean, they are definitely interested in that. And so, uh, back to the uh, uh, beginning slide, so in my opinion, the creativity is a very important uh, component of our intelligence and our ancestors were creative enough to make use of the environment and you know making all the impressive progresses. So if we migrate to another planet, we will face the same challenge like our ancestors faced, right? But we will, we will need to make use of the environment and understand the environment, make use of the environments and the resources, and you know, think of whatever ways to survive right, in the new environment. But this time, we may be able to do the job better because we have computers, we have artificial intelligence, uh, you know, computational design tools, so that uh, the computers can collaborate with us to you know, generate many good things uh, to help us survive. So. Uh, I think this is a grand and interdisciplinary ch challenge and solving this problem re will require the efforts of many uh, people, not just
computer graphics, uh, 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 computer scientists, but also like cognitive scientists, uh, social scientists, and so on. So uh, I'm very interested in this domain, and that's why I collaborate with my colleagues to organize a number of workshops and uh, uh, to talk about, to discuss these topics in like computer vision conference, cognitive science conference, computer graphics conference. So I thank my students for uh, you know, working with me and doing many cool projects together. Uh, and my PhD advisor, uh, Professor Dimitri Tersopoulos, and some funding agencies uh, that fund our projects, uh, NSF, and in some industry, uh, I mean companies in the industry also. So thank you very much. Time for a couple questions? Yeah, questions. And I can stay here till 3.45, so <laughs> we can also talk offline if you like. Or if you have questions now, welcome. Yes. So you were using a classifier to have a less computationally intensive way of yes. getting the same results as yes. an agent-based model. Um, I, uh, I missed whether you, you were using, uh, or, or what system you were using so for, the, for measuring uh, coziness. Um, have you applied uh, machine learning in, in that? Uh, so the coziness is or? defined by the cost okay. that we come up with. Okay. okay. But uh, so the uh, machine, the classifier we use, we use a random forest right. classifier. So basically, we uh, gen 